Good evening, church. Uh, I was wondering in the back of my mind how many of you who normally go to the Sunday morning are coming to tonight's because we know we're expecting about two or three inches of snow tonight. So <laughs> sorry for saying that four-letter S word. And, but it's good to see everybody uh, here this evening. And I know as we look at the climate of the world today, not just the climate of being really cold in Angola in late November, but uh, the climate of how uh, people are treating each other uh, or the climate that we have to navigate trying to figure out, you know, how do we change these long-standing Thanksgiving or Christmas traditions that we've done for so long? Or, or should we change it? All, all of this, all of the rhetoric that's being thrown around, it, it becomes chaotic and confusing, which is why I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is unchanging and who has power over everything that we could ever face. And so that's why we go to him and worship this evening. Uh, not just singing these songs uh, because they're, they're fun or, or because uh, they speak to us just from uh, the notes or even sometimes just the lyrics, but we praise God because he's worth it. He's worth our time. He's worth all the effort we can give. And it all goes back to when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And when we sing this next song, uh, The Great I Am, it's just got this power behind it about the mountains shaking before uh, the God that we serve, how the demons will run and flee. Whatever things we're facing in our lives, whatever struggles, whatever chaos is there, it shakes before the power of God. He's proven that he has power over the oceans, power over the mountains, power over all creation, and even power over death, which is what he proved when he died for our sins and rose again. So would you uh, go to God with me in prayer as we thank him for all that he's done and all that he will continue to do for us. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we can praise and worship you once again in person. And God, with everything that is in the world around us, that the church has faced through its entire existence, God, that we can always go to you that you work in our hearts this evening. Help us to understand more uh, of your will, which you would have us do, and how you love us, so that we can love others in the way that you would have us. God, we thank you and we praise you. We pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name.
shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Please be seated. Let's do it. 
Good evening, church. I haven't been here on a Saturday night in a while, and it's great to see uh, Saturday night regulars. And uh, uh, We are going to get snow tomorrow, so you guys are probably the smartest group we've got. So, You know, this week in, uh, in America that uh, we gather for Thanksgiving, and uh, maybe some of you do it the week before, the week after, but... Uh, it's been a tradition in America that we gather for Thanksgiving, and it's just a time for family and friends to, uh, to meet around the table and just, uh, you know, just rejoice and uh, just give thanks for all the things that we have in our life. And, uh, you know, if, if I was to stand here and tell you all of those, that we, we wouldn't have enough time. It would be midnight by the time I was done with gratitude with the things that I have in my life. But uh, as Christians, we have something else. Every time we gather, we can uh, come together at the Lord's table every Sunday, and uh, we get to give thanks. We get to give thanks for how our lives have been changed by the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. And not only do we get to give thanks for the things that we have in our life, we also get to give thanks for the things that we don't have in our life anymore. And that's that burden of sin and that hopeless feeling and that despair. That's all been taken from us at the cross. So as we come to communion tonight, I just want you all to just stand there or sit there in your pews and just quietly reflect on, uh, you know, what you've been given by this sacrifice. And I want you to also remember what's been taken from you and just give thanks for that. And uh, we do communion here a little different. Uh, tonight we only have the stations at the back of the church and the communion are there. Uh, we should have enough for everybody, and if for some reason we don't, 
uh, come see us after communion, after service, and we'll make sure that you get communion. So let's go to prayer. Father God, we just give you thanks. And this is a week in America where we just, uh, you know, we focus on gratitude for all the things that we have. But when we gather on your house on Sundays and Saturday evenings and whenever two or more come together, Lord, we just, uh, we just pour out those praise and thanksgivings for not only the things that you've given in our life, but those things you've taken from us. And I just pray, Lord, as we sit here tonight and just quietly reflect on the true meaning of that sacrifice as we hold these two simple elements in our hand, Lord. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Check, 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 check. And this is from the book of Luke. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do likewise. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us do likewise. Now we come to the time of the service where we'll pray over our offering and also the offerings are uh, boxes are in the back of the church. This is our Thanksgiving offering week. Uh, so if you had a chance to get those in, uh, if not, get those in as soon as you can, please. And we'll go to prayer. Father God, you've given us so much, so much to be grateful for. And uh, you ask so much little in return, Lord. I pray that you take these offerings that we're about to pour out to you, Lord, and help us as a church to use them to further your kingdom here on earth, Lord. But most importantly, to reach a world that's so desperately hurting. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Is it okay now? Okay. <laughs> I hate this stuff. Anyway, as I was saying, man, I really sound loud up here right now, but uh, when we have the final hymn um, after the sermon, it's an opportunity to put your membership in. It's an immersed believer if you desire to, or if you got um, desire to be immersed or whatever it may be. Now, if you were here last Sunday morning, or you may have watched it online, um, my wife, Cindy, came up and she put her membership in. We both had our mask on. I said, this is also how you socially distance. And I gave her a kiss through the mask. As I was leaving, Chris said, everybody's going to expect a kiss now when they put their membership in the church. <laughs> so let me preface something. If that helps you put your membership in, I'm all right with it. If it keeps you from putting your membership in, I won't kiss you. Okay, let's just get that straight up right here, all right? 
So just so long, everybody. <laughs> I, I don't know how Chris thinks of these things, but the minute I walk back here, he immediately said, now everybody's going to want to kiss me, put their membership in. Well, last week we talked about um, all the blessings God gave us and how we were responsible to use them properly. Uh, today, we're just going to talk about blessings. We're going to talk about Thanksgiving, Thursday, and all the stuff we've been hearing on the news about what you should or should not do on Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not even going to go there. But the only thing I can say is um, I hope as a nation uh, everyone remembers Thanksgiving. And we do take time to be in prayer, like I said a couple weeks ago, for our leadership. Um, because the Bible tells us to do that. And Timothy, uh, Paul told him. And remember, like I said, when I read that scripture, uh, this is when they were under the oppression of the Roman government. But still, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul was telling Timothy, you pray for the leaders. Those are in authority over you. Uh, I've already made a decision uh, in the next upcoming month or months or year, whatever, anybody that asks me, and you might practice this also, if anybody tries to talk politics to me, my first question is going to be, have you prayed for the president? And if they say no, I'm going to say, then don't talk to me. I don't want to hear it. I used to say, did, did you vote? And if they say no, I'm, I said, I don't want to talk to you. But I'm going to change that. I'm going to say, have you prayed for those in leadership, as the Bible tells us to do? Uh, you know, if you go to any of the stores, the minute they put the Halloween candy up and the costumes on half price, Christmas was everywhere. You know, we've jumped right into it. I, I, well, I, I got to be careful here. Some of you may have already done this, taking advantage of the good weather. You may have your Christmas decorations up already. And that's okay if you did, but I, you do, Chris? Have you turned them on yet? I'm going to send the decoration police after you. But anyway, if you put them up, that's okay. But I'd like to wait till after Thanksgiving before you start flying. So there are decorations everywhere up already. They've been up uh, for a couple, two or three weeks. Uh, I guess more so after Christmas, I want to send the Christmas police out when they still got them up in February or something like that. But it seems like we forget about Thanksgiving. We just kind of hop right over uh, from the Halloween decorations to the Christmas decorations. You used to see pilgrims in the stores and different things like that, and it's just not there anymore. But you see, as God's people, uh, I believe it's fitting that we focus our thoughts uh, not only just this week as we celebrate Thanksgiving, but often upon the goodness of God and offer up our gratitude to Him uh, for all that He is and all that He has done for us. We're going to read the 103rd Psalm. It's a long psalm, but it's a good psalm. Uh, follow along with me. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. But those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding and obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Now someone has labeled this as 
David's Hallelujah Chorus. Uh, Notice in this psalm, he's addressing his own soul. He's reminding himself as he praises the Lord of all that God has done. And in this text, we see him using a grammatical device uh, as a reminder, uh, as an instruction for his own soul. And it's important uh, as we look at this uh, psalm this evening, as we think about Thanksgiving, to understand David was just simply talking to himself. Uh, this is just a time of private uh, reflection and praise to God. And we see him saying, praise the Lord and count your blessings over and over in this. Uh, the first two verses there, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, this is a prayer of nothing but praise to God. Notice there's no supplication. There's no request. There's no petition. There's no plea. It's just pure, unadulterated praise to God. Now, you can almost sense David being awestruck with God's blessings. Now, we're not told the circumstances in which David received this psalm, but it's not difficult to imagine how it happened. Uh, Maybe looking at his life, uh, counting his blessings instead of complaining about his burdens, it dawned upon David how much God had done for him. Realizing how good God had been and how undeserving he was of all these blessings. And springing up from this, almost from the depths of his heart, gushing out into this parchment as he wrote it down, came this prayer of praise, this benediction, expressing his gratitude towards God. Now, we understand that David here in this prayer was praising the Lord with song. You know, if you ever have a problem praising God... Take time to read the Psalms, but especially this one. I remember years ago, uh, I was at some kind of a seminar or convention, and I forget who, I can't remember who the keynote speaker was, but he said, I start every morning uh, by reading out of Proverbs and Psalms, every morning. He said, the first thing I do when my feet hit the floor, I pick my Bible up, it's right there, and I read a proverb, and I read a psalm. And he said, I'm ready for the day. And understand that a psalm is a song. This, these were sung by the Hebrews. Uh, this is what the book of Psalms really is. It's a hymn book. And David was singing this as a praise to the Lord. And you can almost see David. You can almost sense David's sense. He hit full of emotion. He was passionate, uh, praising God with all of his heart. Uh, I would imagine someone like David and his expressiveness as he praises God uh, would probably be, it would probably make a lot of people uncomfortable in many of our, of our churches today. We know this ancient Hebrew king was an accomplished musician. He sang with feeling, conviction. This was a joyous song. And they weren't dry or stale when David was singing them. It wasn't like a funeral dirge or anything like that. You remember, uh, one time as David was praising God, he was dancing as he was worshiping God. His wife um, did not approve, criticized him. God made her barren. Uh, I think God was saying, it's okay to be expressive in your praise to God. You know, it amazes me sometimes, because I I love sports. I love going to basketball games. Uh, And it's amazing for me to watch a lot of people at basketball games and how excited and emotional, um, almost beyond losing control. And then the same people come to church and just kind of sit there and sing the songs and almost like they're at a funeral or something like that. Uh, We get so excited about something that's so temporary, like a basketball game or a baseball game or a volleyball game or something like that, when we really should be excited, as David is here, about what God has done for us. Now, a guy who dances when he worships God would not be in a monotone voice as he was singing this song. Uh, This was a song of praise, and I can see David singing this with joy, with desire to let God and anybody else who was listening know how much he really wanted God to receive praise and glory. And and the Psalms are filled with expressions of praise to God. Just a couple of them. Psalm 34, 1 and 2, David again, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear 
and rejoice. And then again in Psalm 66, the first four verses, shout for God, for, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises of your name. So David was serious in his praise to God. And this wasn't something he did just at the temple or just during a religious ceremony. You can almost sense it was a part of his everyday experience. He was grateful to God and he could not help but praise him. And I believe we need to be in consideration of this. Not just when we're here on Saturday night or Sunday morning during a worship service, but throughout the week. Taking time to remember what God has done for us and to sing his praises, if you will. To thank him for all the blessings he's bestowed upon us. Uh, You might say, as you look at the 103rd Psalm and you think about David singing this, you might say that David was singing the Hebrew version of Count Your Many Blessings. And that's exactly what he was doing here. He was listing all the blessings that God had bestowed upon him. We also see that he talks about life and relationship with God as whole and healthy. Verse 3, he said, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Now we know that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. In the book of Job, we see him going before God accusing Job. You know what? It would be pretty easy Uh, For Satan to do that today before God because he wouldn't have to make things up like he did about Job. He could simply say, look at what Michael did this week. Look at what so-and-so did. These people of yours, they're nothing but sinners. How could they say they really love you and yet do what they do throughout the week? We all have those faults. Our, our, Our lives point that. And the Bible calls him our adversary, the enemy. But we also have an advocate. We have the one who goes to the Father on our behalf. We have Jesus. He doesn't deny that we've sinned. But he said, wait a minute. Those are my children. They're in my grace. I have forgiven their sins. They belong to me. And I'm sure David, as he was writing this psalm and singing this psalm to God, he understands about God's forgiveness of sin. We know what David has done in the past. He knows people, believers, are made whole because of their relationship with God because that's exactly what he's experienced himself. But you notice he also says there, who heals all your diseases. Now, this is why we need to remember that David is talking about his soul. Because a lot of people read this and they'll say, wait a minute, it says here God's going to heal all of our diseases. David wasn't talking about physical diseases there. Now, we do have scripture that addresses that. Uh, James 5, 14 and 15, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. But that's not what David's talking about here. He's not talking about physical healing. Remember, he's talking to his soul. He's talking about his spiritual well-being. You might say, now, wait a minute. Does God, does the soul have diseases? Well, yeah. What are some of the diseases that our souls have? Fear, doubt, depression, anger, lust, hate, jealousy, pride, greed, The list just goes on and on and on, but these diseases of the soul are traced back to our sinful nature, but God gives permanent healing to the soul through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We also see that David talks about life and relationship with God as meaningful, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 first, Who redeems your life from the pit... And crowns you with love and compassion because of his forgiveness of our sins, because he gives us relationship, because he heals our soul's diseases, then we see that our life is not in vain. I believe you could paraphrase this verse simply by saying, he keeps your life from going to waste. 
How many people, maybe some of us, how many people waste the years of their lives on things that in the long run really don't count? We see people spending their days in pursuit of temporary, passing things. And then they wake up one day, empty, tired, and feeling like there's no use going on. In fact, they end up feeling betrayed because of the things they worked so hard to obtain failed to bring them the satisfaction that they were looking for. You see, the world does not offer any hope whatsoever for meaningful living. I don't care whether it's the pursuit of money, financial, or excuse me, material possessions, power, position, thing. It just doesn't do it. But God gives us purpose. He gives us meaning. He keeps our lives from going to waste. Our lives are filled with eternal purpose. Um, All lives that aren't lived in Christ are only a shell of what God intended life to be. And this is one of the benefits of knowing God. Our lives count. They're not in vain. They have eternal significance. And this is another one of the things that David is praising the Lord for. In verse 5, he said, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. And I believe that's saying to those of us that are growing older, that he gives us satisfaction in our old age. Remember, again, he's speaking to our soul, his soul. And he's saying here that one of the benefits of being God's people is that when we're old, we won't have to look back on our lives with regret. Regardless of your age or of how many years you've walked upon the earth, God gives satisfaction. I was talking to a friend of mine that I I talk to quite often on the phone. He just has so many struggles. And and I know that he loves the Lord. And I I know that he has a, a heart that cares about God, but he lets doubts creep into his mind. And he called me again this past week and and, and, and we were talking. He was concerned about his salvation. And I said, we all mess up. I said, if you remember when I used to preach at South Milford, you probably heard me say more than once. If I looked out over the congregation and said that anybody here this morning that sinned, you got to leave. I'd leave the parade. I'd be the first one out the door. We all sin. But God's love, his grace as were his children through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he forgives us. Don't forget that. I know that he knows that. But sometimes we need to be reminded that God's love covers a multitude of sins. And we can look upon our lives with satisfaction. And, and, I, and I told him, I said, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Just knowing that you're doing the best that you can. Yeah, we mess up once in a while. Sure, we slip once in a while, we fall back once in a while, but if we know we're trying, that's all God expects. And as long as we're trying to live that life that exemplifies Jesus Christ, even though we're not perfect and we can't be, then have the satisfaction of knowing that your life counts and God cares about you. Here's six practical suggestions to consider as you take time to praise the Lord. First of all, be aware. Don't forget his benefits, as David here is telling us. Be honest. Don't put on an act. Just recognize who you are. And when we mess up, say, God, I'm sorry. Uh, I've messed up. I ask for your forgiveness. Be grateful. I don't think there's anything that encourages praise like gratitude. If we can just develop that thankful heart, not looking at what we don't have, but looking at what God has given us and what he's blessed us with. Be vocal. Tell somebody. Sing these praises. Bless somebody with your testimony. You know, how many times have I said, and and you'll hear me say this, I don't know how long the Lord will allow me to preach here, but you'll hear me say this time and time and time again. The best way to witness for the Christ is just tell your story. Tell somebody what God means to you. Tell somebody what God has done for you. You don't have to quote a bunch of scripture. Uh, You don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible or anything like that, but just tell your story. Let someone know why you love God and why God loves you. You might be surprised how that will bless someone else. Be natural. 
Praise God in a way that's natural for you. Do you feel like raising your hands during worship? Raise your hands. Uh, we've got a young man that comes here once in a while, and every so often he kind of sits in the back. Sometimes when we're singing, he's, he's turning around, he's on his knees and his head and his hands on the pew there. I'm glad he feels like he can express himself that way because that's what he feels like at that point in time. Be natural and then be consistent. Make praising God a part of your everyday experience. So I guess we need to ask ourselves, are we living a life in relationship with God? If so, we have to praise him. That's what David here was showing us. And we praise him with our life. Now we need to be careful. There is a caveat here and not fall into the rut that the Israelites did. Uh, saying one thing and doing something else. Isaiah 29, 13. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they've been taught. So we don't come here just on Saturday night or Sunday morning and say, yeah, that sounds good, preacher. Or boy, those songs really inspired me. Or the communion meditation really touched my heart. And then forget about it the next day. We do our best to live it daily. David said, I will praise him with all that is within me. That means we praise him with our attitudes, our actions, our family, our finances, our words, our work, our faith, our relationships, our voice, our vocation, our church, our children, our hobbies, our habits. In other words, we praise him, not only in word, but also in deed. I will praise him with everything that is within me. I'm going to read verses 17 through 22 again. Follow along with me as we close out. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear or respect him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Father, I believe if we try to make a list of all the blessings, all the reasons to praise you, we'd, we'd run out of paper. As we take time to look back over our lives, there's so many ways you've intervened, you've watched over us, you've blessed us. And Father, we thank you for that. It's so unfortunate that as a nation, we have to be reminded once a year to be thankful. And unfortunately, even as we're reminded to be thankful, many aren't. Many complain. Many look at what they don't have. They just grouse about life. Father, help us to be those positive individuals, to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth that you've told us to be by simply living a life in gratitude, living a life of praise for all that you've done and above everything else. If we feel like we have nothing to be thankful for, we need to stop and remember your son, his death, burial, and resurrection that we might have forgiveness of sin, and the hope of eternal life. Father, I, I, I pray that in my life, as well as those that are gathered here, that we do praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. Through your son's name we pray, amen. Let's be standing, shall we? Oh, oh.
everybody here tonight and I hope that song resonates and stays on our hearts not just through this week and on Thanksgiving Day but as we continue uh, to live those lives that exemplify and praise God's name. Have a great evening and um, thanks for the forecast Stephen about snow tomorrow.